good evening and welcome to this program, The Origins of Catacombs in Pre-Revolutionary Paris. I'm Laurel Westendorf. I'm part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. And every month we explore a theme in our programming, and this month's theme is Underground. Check out more of our free programming at deschuteslibrary.org forward slash calendar, or you can find recordings of programs on our YouTube channel like this one. Our presenter is Thomas M. Luckett. Thomas has been a faculty member of the Department of History at Portland State University since 1992. His research focuses on the social and economic history of France in the 18th century, particularly in the city of Paris. Thank you so much, Thomas, for sharing with us this unique history of Paris. So thank you, Laurel, and thank you to the um, Deschutes Public Library. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give this, uh, this talk this evening. And um, I'm not sure everyone uh, who, who hears these talks is aware that this is in, in one sense a very unusual and interesting series uh, in the way that it's organized. Because usually when we as academics are, are contacted um, to give a public talk, we're sort of asked, well, what's your current research and could you tell us about it? And here we was, uh, I was assigned a topic. Uh, and the topic is the Paris Catacombs, a subject that I hadn't thought a lot about before December, uh, but I thought, well, I can look into it and learn all about it and 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 report back on on sort of the scholarly literature in the field. But as I got into it, became more and more interested in it and started to identify some interesting sources from the 18th century, uh, which is the area that, you know, the, the time period that I work on, I thought, um, well, maybe I should uh, do something more than just report on the secondary literature and, and try to add something new to the subject. So that's what I'm going to do this evening. I want to begin by saying a little bit, you know, I'll move my next slide, uh, by saying a little bit about what I'm not discussing this evening. Um, what I'm not discussing, except for in this slide, is sort of the way we imagine the catacombs today. The catacombs is this vast underground macabre museum of bones, uh, 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 an underground museum that sells tickets that receives every year hundreds of thousands of visitors, one of the most popular tourist attractions in France, uh, where people come to view uh, elaborate displays of human bones. That modern conception of the catacombs, and indeed the very idea of calling this the Paris catacombs, we'll see it had a different name earlier on, uh, was the work of this person, Louis-Étienne Ericard de Thury, who was um, Inspector General of Quarries from 1809 to 1831, that's for more than two decades. And I'll tell you in a moment what an Inspector General of Quarries is, I'h uh, will come back to that. Uh, uh, but he took over the management of this site and turned it into a museum that one can visit. Uh, in 1815, he also published a, what was at the time, very popular book on the Paris catacombs called Descriptions of the Cat a Description of the pa Catacombs of Paris, which is full of um, nonsense and misinformation that it was then so endlessly repeated in subsequent work on the catacombs that it's often hard to tell the difference between uh, the reality and the legend. Eric de Thierry was a politician who sat on the far right of the French uh, Chamber of Deputies and um, as such was strongly opposed to the French Revolution and he wanted to use the catacombs to promote his critical vision of the French Revolution, even though as we'll see the catacombs really has nothing to do with the revolution and its origins, it was created earlier than that. Um, so what will I be talking about? Um, I wanna talk about the origin of the catacombs in the 1780s at a time when it was not yet called the catacombs, uh, a time when it went by a different name, a uh, rather less memorable name perhaps. It was called the Charnier de la Tombissoire, which means roughly the charnel house of the tomb of Issoire, of the Issoire tomb. Um, uh, and I'll mention this only once and then go on, but uh, the, the, it's, it's, it was created at a site in the south of Paris called the Tombissoir because of a medieval legend that a giant named Issoir was slain by some hero in the 10th century uh, at that very site and buried there. So that's where the funny name comes from. Um, but 
the creation of what would later become known as the catacombs was uh, the work of many people, but it, the, at the highest level, it was administered primarily by these two individuals. On the left, uh, Charles-Axel Guillemot, who was the very first inspector general of Corps. He's named to that office when it was created by the king in 1777, an office that he held until 1791 when due to political intrigues, uh, he was thrown out of office and actually imprisoned for a time, but fortunately uh, was not guillotined in the terror. So he survived to be reinstated to his office in 1797 and, and continued to hold it until his death in 1807. On the right, Louis Tirou de Con, um, inspector or Lieutenant General of Police for Paris um, from 1785 to 1789. The, the Lieutenant General of Police in Paris was a royal officer who reported directly to the, what was effectively the interior minister at Versailles. So there's a direct extension of royal authority into the administration of Paris. And Thierry de Con did lose his life in the terror of the French Revolution, which is why he dies in April, 1794. Um, so together they were largely responsible for the decisions that led to the creation of the catacombs. So my talk will proceed in three parts. First looking at quarries and their discontents, uh, um, stone and gypsum quarries that uh, often lead to disastrous sinkholes in the city of Paris. Part two, um, the Cemetery of the Holy Innocents, which was the largest uh, pauper's cemetery in Paris and, um, and was eventually so overflowing with cadavers that something had to be done. And then uh, part three, looking at how these two separate histories merged when the contents of the Holy Innocent Cemetery were transferred to uh, a site in the uh, reinforced stone quarries in the south of Paris as their permanent resting place. Um, and, uh, and as I go through this, I'm gonna be building a, uh, a certain argument into my, uh, my, my presentation that has to do with the idea of the holy innocence. What does the term holy innocence refer to and how was it reinterpreted in 18th century Paris? So let's begin with quarries. It, has, it happens to be the case that Paris, unlike many other major cities, is constructed in the center of a region that uh, due to its natural deposits produces very high quality building materials, specifically limestone, quality limestone that is perfect for the construction of stone buildings and uh, gypsum, a mineral that is used to make plaster. Um, and uh, locals have been quarrying or mining these materials for literally thousands of years, going back to prehistory. Uh, more at the edges of the city in areas that were not previously part of Paris, but then as the city of Paris grew, it, it grew over these previously mined areas. So this is a map that was published by the Inspection General of Quarries uh, in um, 1908. And I think it does a really nice job of depicting the problem. And I, I don't know if everyone can see it, but in the north, there's a red kind of meandering line that says in French, the extreme limit of the formation of uh, exploitable gypsum. Um, so north of that line is where you find gypsum deposits. Now, not all of those gypsum deposits were mined and, and, and harvested, but uh, the green areas, uh, the green zones show where the old gypsum quarries are. And I'll, I wanna point out in particular in the Northeast of Paris, this area with a lot of gypsum quarries is called Menilmontant. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the, similarly, in the South of this map, there's a, a meandering line or actually several of them, one in the South, one in the East and one in the West that show the limit of exploitable limestone deposits. And within that zone, you see the rather large uh, regions shaded in reddish orange. That's where the um, uh, old stone quarries are. 
Uh, now, when I say quarry, in the modern day, when we think of a quarry, we're likely to think of something like an open pit mine. Right? Um, these are not these were not open pit mines. In in, in a pre-industrial society without modern earth moving equipment, it is technically possible, but also very very expensive to dig an open pit mine because you have to hire a very large number of people with shovels to spend a lot of time digging and moving earth. It's much simpler, uh, much cheaper, I should say, to dig a shaft going straight down. There were, of course, no uh, elevators. So then you have to build in uh, stairways that the workers can use to get up and down until you get to the proper depth. And then from there, you, 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 you dig um, tunnels radiating, radiating outwards into the deposits. Um, and if other uh, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs are building um, uh, their own quarries on the adjacent lots, and eventually you're going to intersect each other and create uh, 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 quite a complex maze of intersecting um, underground tunnels. And this is exactly what happened over a period of many centuries. Um, so that by the 18th century, uh, this system of underground tunnels was was very poorly mapped. Uh, it was not known where most of them were. And from time to time, there was um, uh, a disaster as a spectacular sinkhole would open up and swallow a building or a street. Uh, the people who happened to be unlucky enough to be uh, present. I've been going through, uh, in preparation for this talk, going through the journal, uh, kind of diary, kept by a Parisian bookseller in the 18th century. His name was Simeon Prosper Hardy. And I happen to be part of a large team of researchers who are publishing his journal in what will ultimately, ultimately be 11 thick volumes. Uh, he was very prolific, uh, uh, keeping a diary, not of his own life, he, he enters into it once in a while, but not very much, uh, but of all the events going on in Paris. For the, for the quarter century preceding the French Revolution, it is our single richest source for the history of Paris. So I went through and looked at what does he have to say about the quarries and about the accidents involving the quarries. And curiously, he says almost nothing about them before the mid 1770s. And then he starts to record more and more accidents involving sinkholes. So I'm not sure how to interpret that. Is it that the sinkholes weren't really happening before the 1770s, and then um, for some structural reason, they became a problem. Or what I think is probably more likely they would kind of been happening all along, but people hadn't been paying attention to them. Uh, at least the public hadn't been paying attention to them. Uh, but for whatever reason, the public uh, and the administration became aware that this was a problem in the 1770s. And in 1777, then the king, uh, and his ministry created a whole new administration to confront this problem. It was called the Inspection General of Quarries. And the first person appointed to head up that administration, we've already seen his image here, is on the left, uh, Charles Axel Guillemot, a brilliant administrator, architect, um, engineer, who was really the right person for the job. Um, and he began, um, well, first of all, he, Curiously, on his very first day in office, the very first day he arrived for work in April 1777, the first thing he learned was that his, you know, his employees came to him and said, um, a sinkhole has just opened up uh, in the south of Paris and it's your job to deal with it. He had to rush off and work on that. Over the following years, um, he systematically, as systematically as possible, explored the uh, quarries and reinforce them, replacing old uh, um, uh, pillars and supports with new ones. Uh, one legal problem he ran into is that whereas he could work on the quarries all he wanted under the streets because the streets belonged to the king, um, he had no legal authority to reinforce the quarries underneath private property. So what he did was to effectively create a parallel system of Paris streets underneath the visible streets, complete with um, street signs and, uh, and so on, so that you could go down there and without getting lost if you had a good map of Paris, 
And he invited the property owners then to use his tunnels to access their own properties and do similar reinforcements under the um, under their buildings. But for, for a number of years, it was kind of a game of whack-a-mole where every time he would solve one problem, he would discover five more. But gradually he began to get a handle on it. Um, so that's all the time I have to talk about quarries. I'm gonna go on. Oh, no, there one more big thing issue regarding quarries. Um, the mini Monton disaster. Uh, in the northeast of Paris, uh, in July 1778, a particularly spectacular sinkhole opened up in one of the old gypsum quarries. And this is the description uh, given by Simeon Prosper Hardy in his journal. Uh, amazingly, this entire passage I've quoted here is a single huge sentence, but I won't try to read the whole sentence. Let me just read the beginning and end, basically, which gives the, 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 the principal parts of the narrative. Today, we are informed that about 11 o'clock in the morning, Jean Legree, Seigneur d'Espérois, city tax collector and, it, collector and his wife, Charlotte Catherine de Varenne, who live in Paris on the Rue de Mouton near the Grave, staying at their country house in Mene Mouton and having been invited by the brothers Favier, and then he goes on to describe the brothers Favier and the other people who were invited uh, as well to go on a walk with them, including a, a 10 year old girl, um, to go on a walk in the fresh air near a quarry about a hundred yards from the house of Mr. and Mrs. Legree next door to the house called Bel Air, while Mr. Favier contractor uh, measured and uh, inspected a lot that he had just purchased and on which he planned to construct a small pavilion. The grounds suddenly opened up beneath their feet and plummeted them to a depth of at least 60 feet without any of the seven having been able to escape from such a terrible disaster. And, and in fact, it took them, um, took about, it took a number of weeks to just uh, find and, and dig out the, um, the, the, uh, the bodies of the, the seven people who had died at, in the Mene Montant collapse. And after this, the king intervened, uh, the, the monarchy intervened, it imposed a series of new regulations, at least on the gypsum quarries. They didn't apply to the stone quarries, but from now on, gypsum quarries had to be open pit mines. They could no longer be tunnel, underground tunnels. Um, and all of the old uh, gypsum quarries in the north of Paris were collapsed by exploding them with gunpowder, a process that Guillaume calls um, thunder striking. They were said to be thunderstruck. So I'm going to go on now and talk about cemeteries, and particularly the most important, the biggest cemetery in Paris under the old regime, which was the that which belonged to the a church called the Church of the Holy Innocents. This is an image of the church done by an artist in the 17th century. And it's a good depiction of the church and its adjoining um, you know, buildings, the, the Presbyterian, the fountain, uh, for whatever reason, the artist chose not to sketch in any of the surrounding cityscape, which gives the impression from this image that this is out in the countryside somewhere. In fact, it's in the heart of one of the world's great cities. So you just have to imagine the surrounding buildings and, and traffic and everything else. Um, so on the left, you see the Church of the Holy Innocents with its two spires. On the right, you see the Fountain of the Holy Innocents which was uh, the oldest and said to be the most beautiful fountain in Paris at that time. Uh, fountains in pre-industrial times were not simply decorative objects. They were utilitarian objects because people had no plumbing in their homes. So they had to come to the fountain every day with their buckets to fetch water and take it back home for their consumption. And the building between the fountain and the church is the presbytery, which is the residence of the curate or um, parish priest. Right? Um, the following image may give us a bit of a clear idea of the layout of the cemetery and the church. This is a detail taken that I took from a particularly famous map of Paris done in 1739. It's called the Turgot map, and it uh, shows an aerial view of the city of Paris. 
This was about a half a century before the invention of the hot air balloons. So no one had ever actually seen Paris from the air. The artist just had to imagine what it would look like if you could. And, um, and in some certain cases, they, they may have gotten things wrong. For instance, in this map, no matter how hard I, how much I zoom in, I can't make out the fountain of the Holy Innocence. It ought to be there and it looks like they do it wrong, but that's just my interpretation. But let, let me talk about the larger layout. So we see here in the center, uh, the cemetery of the Holy Innocence, which occupies nearly an entire city block. Um, and and the, the other point I want to another point I want to make about this map is that it's not oriented like normal maps. So um, north in this map is more more or less to the to the left, and east is more or less up. Uh, so you kind of have to turn yourself around to interpret it. But um, so uh, the the block uh, that contains the cemetery of the Holy Innocents is surrounded by the the Rue Saint Denis on the east, the Rue La Lingerie on the west, the Rue La Ferronnerie on the south, and the Rue Au Fer on the north. Um, just a block or so to the north of the cemetery is an area called Les Halles. You can clearly make out those words. Uh, an open area where um, that had one of the world's largest open air markets. Um, and it continued to be an open air market until the 1970s when they finally moved it south of the city to the suburb of Rangis. But um, at that time, it was an open air market in the center of Paris where you could buy meat and fish and vegetables and used clothing and <laughs> flea market items and just a little bit of everything. So not out of regular stores, but out of kiosks and stands. Um, um, often by fairly impoverished vendors uh, at relatively low prices. It was, uh, and by the 18th century, the market uh, at, uh, had grown so large in terms of number of people, volume of business and so on, that it really didn't have enough space anymore. It needed to expand, but where are you going to expand uh, in the center of Paris? Um, but to come back to the block that includes then the Holy Innocence uh, Cemetery, we can see that uh, the church is in the northeast corner, as I've already described. All around the block are uh, apartment buildings, uh, six stories tall, except on the north side where they're a bit shorter. Uh, uh, plus they're, they're underground cellars. Um, and people actually lived in those apartment buildings. And if they had rear facing windows, then they looked out onto the cemetery. Uh, within the cemetery are several uh, religious monuments, including um, iron crosses. Um, the cemetery of the Holy Innocents is very old. It had been a parish cemetery before the um, um, uh, before the uh, you know, 10th century. Um, but in 1186, it was transformed into uh, a pauper cemetery that would receive um, uh, 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 people dying from all over Paris. And um, it, 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 it was the cheapest place to get buried in Paris, though, though some wealthy people chose to be buried there as, as well. Um, the, and it continued to receive very large numbers of cadavers then for nearly six centuries until it was closed in 1780. Um, there were a number of writers in the late 18th century who estimated that the number of people currently being buried each year in the Holy Innocence Cemetery is about 3,000 per year. Um, those estimates are probably too high, but they seem to have derived from an estimate put forward by a man named Francois Portrain, who for nearly three decades was the kind of gravedigger in chief uh, directing the crews there. And um, 
he estimated that in the three decades he had worked there, they'd buried um, uh, about 90,000 people. Again, that's prob that his estimate was probably too high. There was a, a great historian named Madeleine Croisil who in the 1970s published a, an article where she went carefully through the archival evidence for the first half of the 18th century. And she estimated that it was more like about 1,800 people per year were being buried in the Holy Innocent Cemetery. In the same period, uh, she estimates the number of people dying all across Paris was nearly 10 times that number. So, so it's not all the people dying in Paris who get buried there, right? But it's this uh, significant portion. Um, but you have to wonder, in a cemetery that has been receiving cadavers for centuries, how do you continue to bury such large numbers of people? How do you find room for them? They were, of course, buried without any kind of coffin, uh, and they were constantly dug up and moved around. Uh, basically, the way the work would proceed is that the workers, the crew headed by Francois Fortran, would uh, dig a huge trench, uh, 25 to 30 feet deep, um, and use it as a mass grave filling in bodies until it was completely full and they would cover it up and then dig a new trench somewhere else. Uh, and then over time, the, um, the, uh, the bodies would decompose, uh, um, being reduced essentially to bones and their, uh, their volume would decrease. Um, the, uh, um, uh, so um, in February, 1780, uh, the crew was digging another very large trench. And this was over toward the west side, uh, near the buildings that run along the Rue de la Langerie. And as they were getting deep into the ground, uh, the earth collapsed back into their trench. Um, and uh, no one was hurt in the collapse. But the uh, following that collapse, the residents in the buildings along the Rue de la Langerie began to report uh, noxious, foul-smelling uh, um, gases and liquids that were seeping into their houses, particularly into their cellars. Uh, they would go down into their cellars to try to see what was going on and become very, very sick from breathing the air and have to be pulled back out again. Um, though they found that in, after a few hours in the fresh air, they managed to fully recover. They also noticed that when they went down into their cellars with candles to try to see what was going on, the candles would not keep burning. The, the air would not support a flame. And I find that, that, that detail really fascinating because just two years earlier, the founder of modern chemistry, um, Antoine Lavoisier, had published one of the most important breakthroughs in the history of science. He discovered the element oxygen. That is to say, he discovered that air is composed of several gases of which one, oxygen, is necessary both to respiration and to, um, uh, uh, to fire, um, to combustion. And, and so um, I don't know how many Parisians were keeping up with the latest scientific discoveries, but it's just possible that they could have figured out that um, Air that will not support a flame will also not support human life. So the, the monarchy acted very quickly. And uh, well, it took a couple of months, but pretty quickly. They um, condemned the cemetery. They order, ordered that no more bodies are to be buried there. Um, they then condemned the, the buildings all around the block and um, used eminent domain to buy out the, um, the, the owners. Um, and they began to make plans to eliminate the cemetery entirely, including even the church. But a lot of those plans got put on hold for five years um, until finally under the new Lieutenant General of Police, uh, Thierry de Cron, um, they began to make progress. Now, I, before I go on to look at how they're going to transfer the contents of the cemetery, <laughs> to the stone quarries, I want to say a bit more about the Holy Innocents. Um, who are the Holy Innocents for which the church is named? And you may be already familiar with the story. It's found in the gospel according to St. Matthew. The Holy Innocents 
are the um, the infant boys who, according to Saint Matthew, were murdered by order of King Herod the Great in ancient Judea because he was afraid that one of them, according to the Magi, uh, would uh, was a direct descendant of King David and would come to be a, a legitimist pretender to the throne of Israel that he currently occupied. Uh, and I should mention, by the way, that uh, modern sort of biblical scholars and historians who study this field are uh, persuaded that this is not a real historical incident, that this didn't actually happen, that it's a legend that emerged probably out of the fact that toward the end of his life, Herod the Great killed many other people, including uh, three of his sons, because he was afraid that they were rivals for the throne. But so the story in our ancient sources is told only in this one source, essentially one sentence in the, in the book of Matthew. Uh, then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent men and killed all the boys who were in Bethlehem and all in its vicinity who were two years old or under, according to the time in which he had determined from the Magi. Um, and famously, uh, Jesus and his family escaped the massacre because his parents had been warned and had fled to uh, Egypt as refugees. Um, on the left, uh, so this was a very important theme in um, Catholic iconography. It's part of a larger phenomenon called Catholicism called the cult of the saints. The, um, the holy innocents are considered the very first saints, but they're not, uh, they're not just saints, they're martyrs of the holy church. So they're the very first martyrs in Christian history. Um, it's good to be a saint uh, in Catholicism. It's even better to be a martyred saint. Uh, they are the holiest of all saints. And so the, um, the saints are beings of uh, an almost supernatural nature to whom one can pray for intercession in this world. Uh, they are not only mourned as victims of Herod's tyranny, but venerated um, as sort of points of communication privileged points of communication between the physical world and the spiritual world. Um, and there's a superb book on the cult of the saints by uh, um, Peter Brown uh, and on the rise of the cult of the saints starting in about the sixth century AD, where he argues that the development of the cult of the saints is one of the most original and creative developments in the whole history of Christianity. He's unable to find anything similar in previous religious history, whether Christian or pagan. Um, and a lot of the originality was the fact that Catholics did not simply venerate the saints by honoring their memories and their accomplishments. They actually venerated their bodies. Um, their dead bodies or pieces of their dead bodies were preserved, uh, held in um, um, uh, votive con um, uh, containers called uh, reliquaries. Uh, churches prided themselves on their relics and their reliquaries. The um, Church of the Holy Innocents in Paris claimed to have, and one often is skeptical about these stories, but it claimed to have among its relics uh, a, uh, the preserved mummified remains of one of the actual Holy Innocents murder murdered uh, by orders of Herod in ancient Bethlehem. Um, on the left, I've shown you a, a 10th century icon of um, uh, uh, religious icons depicting the massacre with Herod on the left, the mothers uh, pleading for the lives of their children on the right, the soldiers in the middle killing the infants. The most famous depiction of the Holy Innocents in Western art is probably that of Peter Paul Rubens done in the early 17th century. Uh, which I've shown on the right. About the time, the same time he was painting that image, um, the uh, Italian poet Giambattista Marino wrote a great epic poem called The Massacre of the Innocents, which has just recently been translated uh, in a beautiful English translation by Eric Butler. And, and of course, much of it describes the massacre itself. But I want to quote from the, the end, the final section where he, um, he describes the triumphal arrival of the holy innocents in heaven, where they are greeted by King, the spirit of King David, who of course arrived centuries earlier. Um, 
And being a singer-songwriter, uh, David sings them a song that includes this stanza. Oh, sacred, holy, blessed martyrs, unconquered heroes and chosen few, ones elevated by the highest leader to die even before he dies for you. You are harvested by a cruel reaper who are innocent, unripened fruit. Made crimson by your own blood, you were born like fragrant roses between piercing thorns. There was a fascinating incident in Paris in 1750 that relates to this. Um, there was a riot or uh, a major riot in Paris in the spring of 1750, sparked by rumors, partially true, but greatly exaggerated, that the police of Paris were kidnapping children in the streets of Paris and shipping them off to New Orleans in a corrupt and misguided attempt to populate the French colony in um, uh, Louisiana. Of course, these are the children of the poor uh, that they caught out in the streets. Um, and um, as the rumors continued to circulate in Paris, there's a great book by this, about this called by Arlette Farge. As the rumors circulated in Paris, they became more and more detached from reality. And the Parisians began to claim that the children weren't being taken to New Orleans at all. They were being taken to Versailles and murdered and bled to provide a blood bath for a prince of the royal blood, uh, let's say a member of the royal family, who had leprosy, which was the disease of tyrants, uh, because apparently a blood bath is the best cure for, for leprosy. And, um, and indeed, as these, these rumors developed, the uh, um, uh, versions emerged claiming that it wasn't a prince of the blood, it was the king himself, King Louis XV, who suffered from leprosy. Uh, Flavius Josephus, the ancient um, Jewish historian, tells us that Herod had died of um, uh, a disease that was extremely painful. We're not sure what it was, but um, traditionally in Catholicism, this is determined, uh, is, 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 uh, interpreted as, as the disease of leprosy, which God sent upon him as a punishment for the massacre of the holy innocents. So somehow all of these things are mixed up in the popular mind in the, seven, in the 18th century in Paris. Um, leprosy, sin, tyranny, blood, massacre, uh, the holy innocents. So let me go on. So I'm returning just briefly to this map to show you the move of the contents of the Holy Innocent Cemetery um, from the center of Paris, where the cemetery was, to the south, where the, uh, the quarry was that had been selected as their final resting place at this site called the Tombe Soir. And so what I'm trying to, oh, and I'll what I'm trying to convince you is that sort of this, the thesis statement of my talk is that um, in venerating and, and, and treating as, as practically sacred the contents of the Holy Innocent Cemetery, in a sense, they, they were the Parisians were make, were associating the modern the poor of modern Paris with the ancient holy innocents, the ancient victims of King Herod. There's a, an identification going on in the popular mind between the holy innocents and the modern poor, which is a, almost a kind of sanctification of the poor. So um, as the, uh, this is an image from 1786, uh, at the time that the excavations had begun or just prior, uh, an artist named Bernier went in and was allowed to make some sketches. And so you could see what the immater inside of the cemetery looked like. Some of these uh, religious monuments are still there, which will soon be moved to the Tombe Soir. Here's another image by the same artist drawn at the same time, 1786. Uh, you see some of those buildings in the background that have been condemned and are no longer inhabited and will soon be torn down. So here are some interesting passages from Ardi, Simon Prosper Ardi, that I think help me to make this connection. So sort of that, that, there's, um, that the Parisians identified the poor of Paris and the, the dead in the, the cemetery with the martyred saints of antiquity. Uh, the first he records um, is a religious um, uh, celebration that was held for the dead. Today, the curate and fabric council of the parish of Holy Innocence 
uh, Rue Saint-Denis celebrated with great pomp a solemn service for the repose of the souls of all those whose bones had been in part transported to the site called the Tobisoire near Petit Montrouge to accomplish the complete suppression of the great cemetery of this parish. The police commissary, Sirot, uh, who had presided over the entire excavation, gave a great dinner. A week later, um, 19 June 1786, he describes one of these transports. For months, the, uh, there were wagons full of cemetery contents traveling across every evening, traveling across Paris, carrying the contents of the cemetery. He, he describes one of these processions, which is uh, arranged as a, fun as, a, as, a, as, a, as a religious procession. Between five and six in the evening, they transported from the Cemetery of the Holy Innocence to that of Petit, uh, Petit Montrouge, bags of bones and several broken down lead coffins, including that of Madame de Mailly, who was apparently also buried there. She was, had been one of the um, mistresses of Louis XV uh, half a century earlier. All carried in three hearses, each one harnessed to four horses, caparisoned in black with a silver mo mohair cross and covered with mortuary cloth, accompanied by a brigade of the Mounted Watch, which was the police force, and 24 poor people carrying torches, followed by a carriage draped in black in which rode two priests and two men of the robe. So you have to imagine these kinds of processions happening evening after evening in Paris for months as they're moving the contents of the cemetery. And what I find particularly fascinating in this passage is the 24 poor people whom they recruited to walk and carry torches, guiding, so the, the living poor people are carrying torches to, get, to guide the souls of the dead poor people to their final resting place. Uh, I would be interested to know how, they were, how the so-called poor people were recruited. I, as far as I know, 24 is not a symbolic number. I think they just must have thought it looked good to have six rows of, of four torch bearers. Um, but again, a kind of identification of the Paris poor, the holy innocence. And finally, uh, an even clearer identification in a kind of joke that was going around Paris the following January. It's not a very good joke, but I think it's an interesting one. And the basis of the joke is the fact that when the holy innocence church was demolished, its parish was merged with a neighboring parish called St. James of the Butchery. And across town in an unrelated development, another church was uh, eliminated and, and, and demolished. It was called the Church of the Holy Savior and its parish was merged with a neighboring parish called St. James of the Hospital. So the joke was, since they have sent the savior to the hospital, the rest of us poor innocents can expect to be sent to the butchery. Uh, but again, what I find interesting here is the phrase, the rest of us poor innocents, the identification of the holy innocence of antiquity with the poor innocence of modern day Paris. Um, just kind of wrapping this up uh, in um, uh, February, 1787, Artie happened to be walking down the Rue Saint-Denis when he was astonished to see that the church had been completely torn down. Uh, the church and the presbytery as well. Today, finding myself near the former church of the Holy Innocents, I noticed that this church, which had not been closed and absolutely condemned until the final days of December 1786, had already been largely demolished and its destruction was being completed. And the artist who did this image, his name was Sober, must have been done it at almost exactly the same time because we see this moment in time when the church is gone, the presbytery is gone, the fountain is still standing. Um, the fountain wasn't technically demolished, it was moved, they dismantled it and moved its stones a few yards to a new site, but the new fountain looks so different from the old one uh, at the center of what became the Place des Innocents that it's not really the same fountain. It's a new fountain constructed with the same stones. And at the back, we see the condemned buildings, the apartment buildings that haven't been torn down yet. Um, we, as far as I've been able to discover, there are no um, images uh, uh, by artists of the underground catacombs in, done in this period. The earliest I know was the one I showed at the outset uh, that was published in 1815. But I found this curious literary description uh, or uh, written description in the police archives. And it has to do with um, our great riot that occurred in Paris at the end of April, 1789. Uh, in which the French guard tried to control the crowd. Uh, this was in the Faubourg Saint-Antoine, it's called the Réveillon Riot. Uh, 
the, the French guard tried to control the crowd for hours and finally um, opened fire on them. Uh, the volley killed, immediately killed 18 people. Others were injured and taken off to the hospitals. But those 18, something had to be done with those 18 corpses. So they're transported across town to a makeshift morgue that had been opened up in one of the rooms of what will soon be called the catacombs. And then um, police commissioner Jean Audin and one of his colleagues were given the job of trying to identify the bodies. And he describes, he'd obviously never been there before. He was very impressed by the place and wanted to describe it for posterity. So he writes in his report, uh, today, 30 April, 1789 at nine in the morning, we Jean Audin and Jacques, uh, Jacques Granat, uh, lawyers at the parliament, royal councillors, and investigative commissaries of the Paris Chatelet, accompanied by Mr. Edmond Francois Soupe, who was a surgeon, went to the cemetery of bones called the Tombe Soir, located at Montrouge in the parish of St. Hippolytus, behind the Hospital of the Charity, to assess the state of the cadavers of the seditionists who were shot by the soldiers of the king and killed last Tuesday in the Faubourg Saint Antoine. Having arrived in the charnel house of the Tombe Soir, we met Nicolas Charles Laplace superintendent of the said house in which he resides. And curiously, we have independent evidence for uh, Jean-Charles Laplace. He didn't just direct the catacombs, he actually lived inside them. Laplace offered to lead us into the said quarry and in consequence, we were led down the stairway, the entrance of which is closed by a small stone pavilion in the form of a semicircle. We made our way through the quarries for five minutes after which time we arrived before a door closed by a padlock that Laplace opened for us. And having passed through the door, we found the 18 cadavers, which we numbered from first to last. And so um, that's really my whole talk. I just wanted to end by, since there's so many terrible books written about the catacombs, I just wanted to suggest two really good ones as possible for the reading if you want to learn more. On the left, there's this book published just a couple of years ago by Erin uh, Marie Lagasse, Making Space for the Dead, Catacombs, Cemeteries, and the Reimagining of Paris, 1780 to 1830, which she, in which she, um, she, um, she examines the various practices around disposal of bed, dead bodies in Paris and how they were, um, that disposal was transformed in this period. So in this period, so a part of her book concerns the development of the catacombs. On the right, um, Andrea Goulet is not actually a historian. She is a professor of French literature. And um, she has written, I think, a wonderful book called Legacies of the Rue Morgue, um, uh, Science, Space, and Crime Fiction in France, which is not about the history of the catacombs, but about sort of the literary history of fiction that depicts the catacombs in the 19th and 20th centuries. A lot of it kind of sensationalist, penny dreadful works that were popular when they were published and then never republished again. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful uh, study of how, of the catacombs in the Paris popular imagination. And I hope we have a little bit of time left for questions. Uh, Laura. Hi. Yes, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. And um, maybe I can stop sharing, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. I wrote those titles down, so I'll send <laughs> them out to the Zoom attendees. Well, let me turn up the light. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I love how you started with uh, what you're not going to talk about. <laughs> and <laughs> and do you find that, I mean, yeah, do most people just have this total, I guess, yeah, misconception about you what know, it was? I th As I looked for information online, um, I found a lot of misinformation. And one good place to see what the misinformation looks like is the Wikipedia article, Catacombs, <laughs> which has a lot of these silly legends that no one has ever bothered to refute. For instance, the uh, claim that in 17, I think it's 1787 maybe, um, the future King Charles I, who at that time was um, uh, the Duc d'Artois, uh, held a dinner party in the Paris catacombs and invited a number of ladies from the royal court, uh, which is absurd. He would never have done anything like that. And then that the following year, Madame de Polignac, uh, one of the uh, Queen Marie Antoinette's best friends, did the same thing, held a dinner party in the catacombs. There's absolutely, so, so that story derives from um, uh, 
uh, that that first patient, the first person I mentioned, Eric Carr, Eric Carr, and um, he doesn't cite any evidence, and I find it, I can't disprove it, I guess, but I find it absolutely impossible to believe that any such thing ever happened. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of nonsense that's crept into the history of the catacombs. I will, I will though say that um, if you look at the official website of the catacombs itself in Paris, um, you know, the, the museum that you can visit where you can, you can go buy the tickets on their website, they don't present a lot of historical information, but what little they present, I think is more responsible. They've managed to avoid a lot of the legendary stuff. Mm. It's a shame when the oldest book about it is <laughs> the least reliable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because people probably assume. Yeah. All right. Anyone have any questions? I mean, I I learned so much that I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> but I don't know that people have that many questions. <laughs> Yeah, well, I definitely asked the right person, Thomas, because <laughs> to investigate this, because <laughs> this went in a different direction, but a great direction uh -huh. than what I was thinking. Um, I, I mean, maybe one other misconception I'll point out, and I'm not sure, maybe this is my misinterpretation, but um, in um, the old Lon Chaney movie of The Phantom of the Opera, and in some other versions as well, as well, including the the novel on which it's based, the Phantom at one point seems to descend into the catacombs um, and wander around in them. Um, but what may have been clear from that map I showed is that there are no quarries anywhere near the Paris Opera. <laughs> that wouldn't work. So that's false. I mean, I I'm assuming that that sludge, that gross stuff and the lack of air was just from the gases from the bodies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean that's even if ninety thousand is, you know, way over, even if it's <laughs> seven even if it's seventy thousand bodies, like that's so many people yeah. or so many cadavers that that's Yeah. It's really hard to and it's really hard to imagine that that was the first time a smell complaint came through also. Yeah, that that's when it finally reached it. But I think yeah. I think by that time, perhaps the monarchy was almost hoping that something like this would happen because mm. they really, you know, they liked urban planning projects and they really wanted an excuse to take over that prime real estate and turn it into an extension of Leal, which is what it became um, by, uh, by within a few years, it, uh, it had opened up as a great extension of the Leal market district uh, with the, that included now the hay market and, um, and the uh, vegetable market. Uh, so it allowed them to expand that commercial activity in the center of the city. And we do have a question here. What is your favorite truth about the catacombs? <laughs> My favorite truth? Um, um, I guess I'm not sure what's meant by truth, but I guess, I mean, I, I guess I would just return to the central point that I'm trying to make here, which is that partly because of the way that everyone still loves 19th century Gothic romances and the catacombs seems like something out of a Edgar Allan Poe novel. I think we like to think of the catacombs as something gruesome. And I don't think the people who created it imagined it as being anything like that. I think they imagined it as something sacred. Uh, something that expresses the I, that expressed the ideals of their religious conceptions. So it wasn't made to be macabre. It was kind of a reference. I don't think so. I mean, I think we often have difficulty today understanding why <laughs> why saints' relics. Why were these things preserved? But it was very very important at the time. And um, imagine living in a physical landscape that is just dotted with these privileged points of communication where you can go pray to the saint and the saint will intervene for you with God. It's like, it's like you have all of these, these portals or, or telephones open by which you can gain um, uh, direct communication with the spirit world. 
Yeah. It would be a totally different <laughs> place. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Thomas. This has been really fascinating. And yeah, I, I thank you so much for doing all this research and for talking with us tonight. Okay, well, you're very welcome. Thanks. Good Have night. a good night, everyone.